Father God, I've heard the words of this song now several times. Yet, the reality of it is, for me, it's so easy to lose amazement in the greatness of what you've done for me. I can get caught up in the midst of important things, but not as important as you things. And the goodness and the grace and the kindness and the mercy and the love that you pour out to me through Jesus Christ and your spirit, I can become dull to. I can become mundane. Revive that in me that needs to be revived. Remind me to be someone who lives in the amazement of the goodness and the grace that you show. And thank you that you do. For certainly our behaviors aren't ones that earn that, but yet this is not about what we've earned, but about what Jesus has done. And to that, we say thank you. And it is his name we pray this. Amen. You can be seated. Well, welcome to summer at Christian Fellowship Church, right? Um, it's a little different during the summer. We know that people come in and come out. A lot of friends uh, watch us online. Thank you to just some people who, were, who texted me after the service. Say, hey, I, w- I was there virtually, even though maybe I wasn't here with you uh, this morning. This summer, uh, we've been going through this series called Bold, Taking Hold of What God Has Promised. And what we've been doing is we've been looking at the book of Joshua together and, and realizing that it's some four or 500 years after God had made a promise to the people of Israel that they would get their land, that we find ourselves in the book of Joshua. And now what they were gonna have to do is take hold of what God had promised. And we've been talking about this series. We said that the reality is, is that when God promises us things from time to time, sometimes he just blesses us in our sleep. And by that, I mean this. There's not a thing we have to do to get the promise from him. He just loves us as a good father, and we're his sons and daughters. He just wants to do it for us. But there are times where God makes a promise to say, I want to take you there. But the fulfillment of that promise is intertwined with how we're going to choose to obey or not obey on the journey. And that's the reality of the book of Joshua. And we've, in many ways, been kind of drawing this together and making some analogies to our journey as a church body as we move from this place to about 3.8 miles down the road or so in about nine months as God prepares us. What are we doing to take hold of what God's promised? How are we obeying? How are we listening? And so we've been making those parallels. And in chapter one of the book of Joshua, God came to the leader of the Israelite people, Joshua, and said this three times, be strong and courageous, be strong and courageous, be strong and courageous. Why? Because he knew there were some things that are gonna be in the future as he took a hold of the promise that are gonna test him. So we wanted to encourage him at the beginning. And so in chapter two then, as we are introduced to Rahab, who's in the first city that has to be taken in the promised land, Jericho, we discover that she also chooses to listen to God's direction instead of maybe some other options that she could have had. And then we get to chapter three and following and we discover that they cross the Jordan River and some amazing things happen there as Pastor Will talked about that. And the next week, We see they actually conquer the city of Jericho in the most unusual battle plan of all times. They're just walking around the city and God falls the walls or fells the walls, so to speak. And so we make our way to chapter 7 and everything seems to be going really well in the book of Joshua until they reach the city called Ai. And as we looked at Ai, what we discovered was is that they went up against a force that should never have been able to take out the Israelite people, yet... In that moment, because of the sin of a particular person that had happened in chapter 6, Achan, taking of the devoted things of God, and also because Joshua, as he moved forward in taking hold of the promise, failed to check in with God along the way, they wound up suffering a very humiliating defeat. It It was very bad. It was very Horrible for them. And what we discovered was that their hearts melted and they had fear and they they were dismayed. And so last week, we delved into the last part of chapter 7. And we talked about the consequences that came into Achan's life because of what he chose to do. And we asked ourselves this question. Do we find ourselves from time to time following along the same line of thinking that can lead us to the places that Achan wound up in? Things like we feel like God is holding out on us or it's not a big deal or no one will ever know or ah, I'm stuck and I can't get out. If you weren't able to 
to listen in person or online. I, I do encourage you to go back because the end of chapter 7 is, is a very difficult time. Yet, as we end chapter 7 and we pick up this morning in chapter 8, and if you have your Bibles, I encourage you to turn there, Joshua chapter 8. Need a copy? Just raise your hand and someone will hand you a physical copy of Scripture. Or, like I know many of you do, you can dial in on your digital device or pull our app up or whatever it might be and follow along there. But as we find ourselves in chapter 8 this morning, we find the people of God right back at the same place they were at the beginning of chapter 7, at Ai. And when we find them there, it's going to be interesting. And, And for you, hopefully, this big sort of review has kind of helped you remember a little bit, maybe tuned it up. Because even if you've been here, right, the whole time, and you've been to every service, and you've listened to everyone online or whatever it may be, if you're like me, I've discovered that as um, I get chronologically older, my brain from time to time can, needs a tune-up. Some of you with me? I, I've just discovered as I grow again chronologically older that there's this thing that happens in my life, and this is it. I tend to forget the things I should remember, and then I remember the things that I should forget. Right? Right? Uh, this happens uh, in my life a lot. Now that my wife and I's life are a little bit more complicated and that sort of thing, we've started doing certain things, trying to keep it organized so that I don't forget as much. We use um, uh, Alexa. Some of you have Alexa in your home, and yes, she's probably listening, but it's worth it, right? And, um, and we're able just to speak in, and there's a grocery list that gets put on here. So if I'm coming home from someplace, work or a meeting or whatever, just out and about, I can look at the grocery list. And it's helpful that I don't forget stuff because... There have been more than a few times in my life where Kathy will text me or she'll call me or email me or whatever, and she will ask me to pick up some things from the grocery store. And then I will make my way home at the end of whatever I was doing, and I would come in, and she would say something like this. Did you get the milk? And I'd be like, oh, I forgot. And then there would be this moment. It was a kind moment. It it wasn't mean. It was gracious. But it go like this. Help me out here. I don't understand. Now, folks, this is a little cue in our marriage. Whenever a sentence starts with, I don't understand, (laughs) oftentimes it follows up with, I messed something up. She doesn't say that. That's just me, right? I, I don't understand. This is what she said. I don't understand, Brian, how you can stand up almost every Sunday and talk for 34, 35, 36 minutes. And and it seems like you've got everything memorized you want to say and never look at your notes. Yet, you can't remember to pick up milk. (laughs) I don't don't understand that. Some of you know what I'm talking about? Here's something else I've done. Uh, I've been on my phone, which is a common thing for all of us, right? And uh, I, I need to leave for something. And I'm talking to someone on the phone. And as I'm doing it, I'm trying to multitask. Right? Some of you do that? And as I'm multitasking, I'm getting frustrated because I can't leave until I find my phone. And I can't find it. <laughs> Ever been there? Now, some of you younger folks are looking at some of us older folks and you're mocking us internally. <laughs> Here's the thing. If you're not there, you're going to get there. It gets in all of us, chronological age. But here's what I've also discovered. When it comes to spiritual issues, our age doesn't matter. Whether we're seven, or whether we're 47, or whether we're much past 47, here's the thing. When it comes to our spiritual lives, we often remember the things we should forget. And forget the things we should remember. This morning... As we look at the people of Israel who are right smack dab uh, where they were just some time before. And they are going to look into the face of the city that represents their greatest defeat, their greatest problems, the most fear and dismay that they've had in their lives. They're going to have to deal with some memory a little bit. And, and God's going to give it a tune-up. I've discovered in my life, and I, and I know it's true in, in many other people's lives, that we have this tendency. And the tendency kind of works like this. We need to tune up because our life has often been dictated and dominated as we move forward 
by the failures or the mistakes or the hurts of our past. Is that works. We've messed it up, we've blown it up or screwed it up. Or someone has hurt us or they've done horrible things to us, intentionally or unintentionally. And because that is the way it's happened in the past, when then we look at the future, it's so easy to be dominated by the fear that comes into our life or to be dismayed in such a way that what it does, we're so discouraged that we never want to move out and to move forward into, into what God's calling us. We need to tune up. Some of you know people like that? Maybe you even are that person today. That, that person who, um, who draws so much on the things of the past to dictate how they move in the future that by accident or on purpose, you're remembering things that God has long forgotten and you're forgetting things that God wants you to remember. And so this morning, as we look at the Israelites and we, we look at them facing their biggest defeat in their past, my hope and my desire through the word and through the spirit that speaks to us through the word is that we'll remember the right things. Because I know that some of you, even as I've been talking already this morning, whether it's right in here or listening online, you've already got your stuff coming up in your mind. It's hurts, those pains mistakes, those failures. And because of it, it's already beginning to create some conversation in your head that goes like this. I can't move forward what God's asking me to do or I can't do it and why is God asking me and he shouldn't. And with that, I wanna pray. God, show that which is true to us and help us then through your encouragement and your power to live from where you want us to live. We pray this in Jesus' name. All right, so here we are, chapter eight, verse one. And when you read chapter eight, verse one, the first half, this is what it says. And the Lord said to Joshua, do not fear and do not be dismayed. Now, if you were paying attention to my review just a second ago, or you've been here, you know that this isn't something new. God has already said this a while back before they had crossed the Jordan, before they started to take hold of any of the promise. In fact, Joshua chapter one, verse nine this is what it says, God to Joshua, have I not commanded you, be strong and courageous, do not be frightened or be dismayed. Now, as we said seven weeks ago, the first time that God came to Joshua and said this, it was more of a physical encouragement, saying, look, you don't have fear or dismay right now, but there may be a moment when you are, so physically, just keep moving, just keep moving, just keep moving towards what I've called you to do to take a hold of the promise that I've given you. Just continue to obey. But now when we get to verse one of chapter eight, this isn't so much a physical encouragement as it is an emotional moment for Joshua. Where when God understands what has happened at Ai, what Joshua felt, what the people of God felt in that moment, and he understood because of those things, I need to encourage you emotionally because there are two common reactions when pain or failure come into our life. It's fear and dismay. Fear says, well, I don't know. And then when God asks us to go in again, we feel so discouraged, so broken, so whatever it might be, we don't want to move forward and we get stuck in a place. Now, it's the summertime, and I know that, that lots of you, like my family, like to go to the beach. How do I know? Because usually, as I'm scrolling through Facebook on Sunday morning, I discover who's at the beach because they either show, like, their feet at the beach or because it's Sunday and they're at the beach, they want to hold their Bible open and their coffee to make, you know what I'm saying? People like, I've never, yes, we have, right? We've done that. We, we like going to the ocean. We like the beach. It's where we relax, like, like many of you. Sometime back, uh, we, took, we took a trip to the beach, and... Um, we did our typical thing the first day that we arrived. We stopped, went to the grocery store, all of that. And then the next day, boom, we're ready to go to the beach. And, and you know what it's like, right? When you gotta haul all the stuff out there. You get the chairs. You know, if you have an umbrella, we didn't. But, you know, you have all, all the stuff. You get it out there, you slather yourself up or spray yourself down, whatever you do. And you're finally ready. And so we're finally ready to go to the ocean. And I, I take one of my children to the ocean. And we get in the ocean, and I'm not telling you, five minutes into being in the ocean. First day, five minutes, they get stung by a jellyfish. Right there. 
Now, this obviously brought out some pain. And so we went over to uh, the lifeguard and we were asking for help. And we said, oh, by the way, have people been getting stung by jellyfish today? He's like, yeah, we've had about 45 or 50 already. And I thought to myself, shouldn't there be a sign, right? I mean, shouldn't you just let us know a little bit? But there's nothing we can do about it at the moment. That's what happened. You could even see it. Look down at the right ankle and you could see the jellyfish, just the stripes on it. I mean, it, it hurt. All right. So I knew at a moment there was going to be some fear. The, the next day wasn't the best of days uh, for weather and that sort of stuff. So we went putt-putting or whatever we may do. Then following day, two days later, there's some trepidation, right? Well, if I want to go back in the ocean, so what do we do? We go and we, we ask uh, the lifeguard, hey, any jellyfish reports today? Now we're thinking, right? No, everything's good. Awesome. Got in the water. 15 minutes later, same child, same ankle, got stung by a jellyfish. I mean, the other one hadn't even fully healed yet. And so this time we knew what it was and we're, we're, we're bringing the child out and you know, we're doing all the stuff to do it. And there was just this emotional moment there. And it was true. The child looked at me and said, Dad, I feel like the ocean is out to get me. <laughs> Ever felt like the world is out to get you? And then this was said. I am never going back in the ocean again. Now, is that true? No. The child went into the ocean again. But it felt real at the moment. And until that was overcome, I would have a child that went to the beach that never experienced the ocean. The truth of this, many of us have been stung, so to speak, by the jellyfish of life. Whether we were doing something stupid or we were just in the waves and a jellyfish came and found us. And because of the pain and because of the difficulty and out of that moment, we are stuck in the I'm not going back in mode. And so what happens is, is we, be, we begin to look back and we remember the pain and the mistakes or the hurt, maybe the wrong decisions we made or, or what someone has done to us. And we think, ah, oh, if God asked me to do that, I can't do that. That's going to hurt. Or if God asked me to do it, I don't have the capability to do that anymore. So why is God asking me? You see, Joshua, after being routed by a, a much smaller group of people at Ai, would have had every reason to be fearful and dismayed and to have the I'm not going back in mode. So God recognizes his tendency. And what he does is he speaks words into Joshua's life that says this, do not fear or be dismayed. Here's the truth, the principle. God's words to us empower us if we let them. One of the things that I talk about often is the gospel because that's what it's all about. And in moments like this, oftentimes of pain and hurt and we don't want to go back in, we got to remind ourselves of the truth of the gospel, that the gospel is, is that God sent his son Jesus down from the throne of heaven. He left the throne of heaven. He lived a spotless, sinless life after born of the Virgin Mary and then 30 some odd years later died a sinner's death and then rose victorious over sin, death, and the cross on that day we call Resurrection Sunday so that all of us who choose to believe will be put back in a right relationship with God so that we will have the life and life to the full that he came for not only in eternity to come when we pass from this life to the next next, but also in this life. And in those moments where I have the pain and the difficulty and I, can, I tend to remember things I should forget, what I have to do to sort of make up a word is to re-gospel myself. That goes like this. If God loved me enough to send Jesus, if Jesus loved me enough to come, do I really think he would go through all that pain just for kicks and giggles now to put me through more pain? Now, I'm not saying he doesn't feel that way. That's why I have to re-gospel myself. Do I really think that the God of the universe who holds it all together, who lays out every plan, even though it feels like I can't do this that he's calling me, do I really think that God doesn't know what he's doing when he asks? Not what do I feel, but is that true? And in that moment, I have to make a choice. Will I let God's words empower me or will I believe something else? You see, because God not only wanted to spiritually encourage Joshua, he also wanted to physically encourage him. When he, he ended chapter 7, in verse 26, we would have read last week, and if you've been following along, you know this, that God was no longer angry with his people. 
by saying he was no longer angry, what it meant as we've delved into this is that he put his presence back. He removed his presence from the people of Israel because they chose not to obey. And then when they repented and put everything back into line, his presence came back. Yet, here's the thing. When we look at this, when God's presence is back, God is now assuring the people of Israel of victory without ever changing a single physical circumstance. The circumstances were still the same. Ai was still the same. It was still the place that was 16 to 1700 feet above sea level that was in a strategic position better. They were still the people who had kicked the Ai, so to speak, of the Israelites. You know, one commentator said that. They were still the same people. They had still defeated the people of Israel before. They were still the same people because of their victory that the hearts of the Israelite people melted. Yet, what we see here is the reason for Israelites' failure was never about Ai. Ai did not win because they were better militarily. Ai did not win because they were a bigger, better, badder army. Ai simply won because the people of God were walking in a way without God. And when Israel acted presumptuously in their first attack against Ai, yes, they failed miserably. But no matter how great a failure the past had been, what God is now saying, because I am with you, despite the fact that Ai hasn't changed, I'm guaranteeing victory. There is a, a verse that I often have to go back to in my own life when I find myself remembering that which I should forget and forgetting that which I should remember. And it comes from the book of Philippians chapter three. If you know your New Testament at all, you know that there's a man named the Apostle Paul that God used to the power of the Spirit to inspire to write half of the New Testament. And when he got to the book of Philippians chapter three in verse 13, the Holy Spirit inspired him to write these words. But one thing I do, Forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead. Now, we could read that verse and say, oh, that sounds really good. But we can't miss what Paul had to forget. When we read the book of Acts, we understand that Paul was responsible for the death of the first martyr recorded in scripture, Stephen, a deacon in the early church. Look it up in the book of Acts. He wasn't known as Paul then. He was known as Saul, the persecutor of the church. In fact, what we can probably surmise looking at what he did is while he may not have been physically responsible for all the deaths, he was influential in the deaths of many, many Many believers. He was zealous in defending the old Jewish faith in such a way that he brought other people up on charges so that they were persecuted, hurt, and died. Yet one day, he was walking on a road, a road to Damascus, and God got his attention. He said, let's have a talk. And in that moment, it changed everything about the direction that he was going. But you know what it didn't change? The things that he'd done. He was a murderer. I mean, think about this. God used him through the power of the Spirit to pen half of the New Testament. Yet, if we're honest, if he would have applied to be lead pastor of Christian Fellowship Church, we would say former murderers need not apply. True? Because God doesn't look at things the way we do. He doesn't define us by our past. He defines us by his words. You see, over and over and over again, culture and the enemy and so many other people want to say when God is calling us into taking hold of the promise, it's about your past. But here's the truth. It's not about the past. It's about the provider. God will often call us into something that we may not understand how it's going to work, but he will provide if we just walk with him. Listen, listen. God's words often do not change the circumstance. But what they can change is us and how we go after the circumstance. Ever found yourself in that situation where you're praying over and over and over again? Things in your life right now, you're like, God changed the circumstance. God changed the circumstance. God, I got a long list of things I want God to change. 
Sometimes God isn't as much interested in changing the circumstance as he is changing me. And how I deal with the circumstance. Look, some of us need to get what Paul did. He had learned to forget what needs to be forgotten and remember what needs to be remembered. Especially when it comes to taking hold of the promise. And so what Jesus did in our lives, the truth of the gospel, needs to drive us. What, what God does in encouragement here for Joshua also needs to encourage us. Some of you are like, man, you've been talking a long time. You're only halfway through the first verse. That's right. <laughs> we'll get to the rest. Because the next thing that happens is a game plan. Letter half of verse one, verse two. This is God talking to Joshua again. Take all the fighting men with you and arise, go up to Ai. See, I've given into your hand the king of Ai and his people, his city and his land. And you shall do to Ai and its king as you did to Jericho and its king. Only its spoil and its livestock, you shall take his plunder for yourself. Lay an ambush against the city behind it. It's like, hey, you are now going to defeat Ai just like you defeat Jericho. Except this time in Ai, you get to have all the spoils of war. He lays out what we would call a game plan. And, and there's something I want us to understand. There is not anything wrong with developing a game plan, using the insight and the, the mind that God has given us to develop a strategy. In fact, um, as we prepare in nine months to, to move a body of people from one place to the other, it isn't just about moving a building. It's about ministries. It's about so many things. And you can pray for our team because the enemy wants to get in. He's been doing that of late to get in to create some chaos because so much things have to happen. Look, I, I, I find myself like want to hyperventilating in a bag sometimes. Some of you people who love living by spreadsheets, God bless you. That's not me. I don't love that. It's not my fifth love language. It's not my 35th love language. Some of you love that. There's a lot of spreadsheet moments. We gotta get this, 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 and this. We have a game plan. We have a game plan to lay it out about how we can try to keep our church informed and, and keep the right information out there so that we continue to hold the trust of the people God has given to this congregation. We also have a game plan of how do we now engage the new community that God wants us to call us to? How do we keep our staff who are doing more than they've ever done in this moment? How do we keep them encouraged? It's important to have a game plan. The problem isn't having a game plan. It's who we got the game plan from. The primary cause of the defeat of AI, yes, was Achan's sin, but it was also the secondary because Joshua didn't bother to stop in and touch in with God to say, hey, should I continue with this same game plan? He didn't check up. And what we discovered in the first attack on AI, Joshua went with a game plan that was only in his head, but not approved by God. But God now has a better game plan. This is what he says. He said, here's what I want you to do. What I want you to do is I want you, and we'll talk about it a little bit more in a second, I want you to take your group of people, and I want you to sit in an ambush behind the city. They don't know it. Another group sit in an ambush over here. But I want you to take another group of people that's about the same amount, and I want you to walk up the hill to Ai, and I want you to let the enemy see them coming because I'm going to set an ambush. And this is a marked difference in the strategy that he had with Jericho, right? Jericho, you're not setting an ambush. You're just going to keep walking. Eventually, the wall's going to fall. But now, in contrast, catch this. The strategy for Ai was actually based on Israel's previous defeat. This strategy would actually take advantage of Ai's self-confidence. The people of Ai would see it, they would become overconfident because they defeated Israel before and they would attack and God would use this for their undoing. Here's the point. God was actually using Israel's greatest defeat and Joshua's greatest mistake for his good. You know Romans chapter eight, that verse that we kind of throw around a lot? Chapter eight, verse 28. I like to call it the lemonade out of lemons verse. Some of you know that? And we know that God works what? Sometimes when I stop, people are like, is this a trick question? Is he trying? All things, right? And we know that God works what? Again, let's try that one more time. And we know that God works what? Do you know why it's so hard to say that? Because it's so much easier to say that intellectually than to believe that in our heart. 
But do you know what all means in the Greek? All. And do you know what's included in all? All. Even our mistakes. Here's the point. God can use anything, even our defeats, to further his purpose. We look at our past defeats and our mess-ups, our screw-ups, our blow-ups, or the things that happened to us, and we say, I'm not going back in there. And God looks at us and says, guess what? You're the most qualified to do that with my presence. I don't talk about this much, but for about the last two years, I've had the privilege of um, doing a radio show um, on WAVA on the weekends. And um, me and my co-host, we, we interview on a show called Good News for the City, we interview people from the Washington metro area about the ministries they're involved in, and we hope that people get involved in those ministries. It's an interview show, and I was just recording uh, last week, and um, I recorded two guys, a father and a son, who are part of a program that actually meets over at Reston Bible Church called Parents of Addicted Loved Ones. And I've got a parent in there, and then I've got a son who had been ravaged by addiction, you know, I said, how, how, how did you know your addiction had gone so far that, that, that you couldn't lie to yourself anymore? He said, well, I always kind of was lying to myself, but when I found myself shooting up directly instead of other ways, I kind of knew. And what was so interesting, I sat there and I listened to him talk about his addictive story and that sort of stuff. Then I heard him say these words to parents, don't do this. You think you're helping your kids, you're not. Who's more qualified to say that than someone who has been through it? I heard him talk to people who might have been getting this podcast or hearing the show handed to them because they're addicted. He's saying this, it feels true, but it's a lie. Now, if he'd have been living in the place that a lot of us would have lived, he, said, he would have said, well, who am I? I've messed it up, I've blown it up, I've screwed it up. How can I talk into people to that? And God looked at him and said, oh, no, I can use anything. Do you know that sometimes our greatest defeats, our greatest mistakes, our greatest mess-ups are our biggest platforms for what God wants to do next? We look back at it and say, we're not qualified. And God looks at it and says, you're qualified not because of what you've done, but because of what I've said. I've said you're qualified. The decision or the choice we have to make is, are we going to walk in that? Well, then verses 3 to 13 just kind of play out this way. Israel sets a trap, puts about 30 some odd thousand people behind Ai, puts about 5,000 or so people in a ravine uh, to the west, northwest between Bethel and Ai for a second ambush. And Joshua takes his men that he had before and starts climbing up the hill. Right? And when we get to verse 14, this is what we see. As, and as soon as the king of Ai saw this, he and all his people, the men of the city, hurried and went out early to the appointed place toward the Arabah to meet Israel in battle. But he didn't know that there was an ambush against him behind the city. And Joshua and all Israel pretended to be beaten before them and fled in the direction of the wilderness. Catch this, I want to stop here. Here's what happens. Like, oh, they're bringing the same group of people. We got these guys. And they start charging after Joshua. And Joshua's like, oh, no, you got us. And he's running away, right? That's how it's working. He's, he's running away. He's drawing them out of the city. So that in verse 16 it says, So all the people who were in the city were called together to pursue them. And as they pursued Joshua, they were drawn away from the city. The king's like, hey guys, we got them on the run. All you men who are on the fighting age, let's go get them. Not a man was left, it says in verse 17, in Ai or Bethel, who did not go out after Israel. They left the city open and pursued Israel. They came and they looked and they made this assumption because it happened this way before, it's gonna happen this way again. You know how powerful that is in our life? The thought process, because it's happened good before or bad before, it's gonna do the same way without checking in with God. Listen, I know the power of negative because it's happened before, it's gonna happen again. I know it, I'm a Browns fan. (laughs) Stop telling me they're gonna be good this year. I don't believe it till it happens. Why? Because it's ha- never happened. It's always bad. So I assume bad's gonna be again. In this case, because it was good, they, they seem it's gonna be good. So the king of Ai sees Joshua's retreat as some of this sort of deja vu moment, and he falls to the illusion. 
that what they've experienced before is gonna happen again, but instead it's a divinely inspired trap, an ambush, and here's what occurs. They, they bring everyone out, and all of a sudden Joshua just kind of stops and turns around, and he holds up his spear. We don't know how they communicated to the people behind the city, but that was the signal, and all of a sudden, all the men are out, and the people in the ambush behind the city now come in, and they begin to destroy the city, and they set it on fire. And then all of a sudden, I don't know if it was someone in the back of the Aites that were fighting against uh, the people of Israel, they noticed hey, guys, we got a problem. And then they realize, "Uh uh-oh, we got a problem, and they start turning to go back to the burning city. At the same time, Joshua and his army now turns him, and what we discover is is that the 5,000 come from one direction, the 30,000 come from another direction, and the other thousands or so come from another direction, and they're absolutely caught in the middle of the forces. And then all of a sudden, what they thought was a victory turns to a great defeat, and every single one of them killed. What we then discover is another heap of stones is made. This is the third time in the book of Joshua where there's a heap of stones used to remember something. And in this case, as they took AI and made it into rubble, it reminded people that by obeying God, he can turn an organized victory out of our chaos of mistakes. No situation is beyond God's ability to restore, yet too often our memory tells us differently. You would think that maybe that Joshua would then just go to the next city and start it, but he doesn't. He, he takes his people 30 miles back in the other direction and goes back to a sacred place and he's reminded and he reminds the people of what it means to be people who follow God and he resets their memory about who God is and what it means because he knew this reality, we know this reality, that we often remember the things we should forget and forget the things we should remember. See, none of us have ever been in a situation or are in a situation right now beyond what God can set anew. AI proves that. I, I don't know how messed up or bad or whatever you think your life is. I'm not gonna say we compare our lives to others, but I mean, look at AI. It's pretty messed up. God restored that. The the, the conquering of AI teaches us so many things, not the least of which is this. No matter how badly we've failed, we can always get up. We can always begin again. For our God is the God of new beginnings. He is the God that restores. Yet, we need to forget that which is behind and press forward to the high calling of God. What does that look like for you? What does it look like for me? Where have you allowed fear and dismay to begin to reign in your life? I'm not going to do it. Or dismay says, well, I'm not going to step forward in what's calling because God clearly must not know who he's talking to. Or I'm clearly unqualified when, when God calls us to do it. May the words by God to Joshua be words by God to us that go like this. As he said in chapter one, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you choose to go. Father, I don't know what's going on in people's lives in this room, but I I, I do know what's going on in mine. And the great thing is you know what's going on in mine and you know what's going on in the lives of every person in this room and it doesn't caught you off guard, it doesn't overwhelm you, it doesn't do any of that. And God, you're the God who restores, yet too often we are stuck and memories of things we should forget and then we forget the truth about who you are to re-gospel ourselves about your love for us your power and your calling in our life and so today we ask your assistance and your help to put aside that which we should put aside to recall that which we should recall and press forward to what you're calling us in in Jesus name amen I invite you to stand as we do almost every Sunday we have the opportunity to come and to take communion. If you would like to come and to take communion to remind yourself of who God is, we'd love to have you do that. If, if there's something God's calling on you that you, you want to pray about, you can pray right in your seats. God hears this anywhere. But if you feel like you'd like to come and, and pray here at the steps, we, we'd love to do that. Or we even have people in just a moment who are going to step right here in the front. If you want something specific or someone specific to pray with, they want to pray for you. 
Because sometimes we don't even know how to pray. God brings people along to help us in that. Use the Spirit to help us in that. So now may we encounter what God wants us to encounter.